Amen. You can be seated. Hope College. One quick announcement. Uh, This Thursday, I'm kicking off a series I do every fall and spring. It's called a Faith in Film series. Basically, there you go. Shout it out. Uh, We just watch a movie. It's not that deep. We just watch a movie and then kind of talk about how we see faith in it or not and how we can use that to live better for for Jesus. So the the movie we have tomorrow, yeah, tomorrow, 6.30, is uh, the program, and Tim Schooneveld, I don't know if he's here, tall dude, athletic department, one of the co-athletic directors, he's going to be leading the discussion uh, tomorrow. So come out if you have some time. Now, Olivia Vosco is with me. She is a sophomore. Y'all give it up for her. She's a sophomore. She plays basketball, and she uh, is from Holland, so not too far away, and she's undeclared, but thinking about math because she's super smart. So that's awesome. And she is going to read our scripture today, which is 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 11. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it legitimately. This means understanding that the law is laid down not for the innocent, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the godless and sinful, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their father or mother, for murderers, fornicators, sodomites, slave traders, liars, perjures, and whatever else is contrary to the sound teaching that conforms to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which he entrusted to me. Y'all give it up for Olivia. That is the word of God. In the beginning of this letter, Paul writes to his protege, Timothy, he diagnoses the spiritual cancer of false teaching in its uh, varieties, its assorted varieties that can lead people to waste time fidgeting with myths and pointless nonstop debates about any and everything. These people, these false teachers, they desire to exploit, not liberate. They dilute truth rather than submit to it. Some of them did once live and believe rightly but have since relocated to a subdivision where error, disguised as progressiveness, rules the day. These false teachers, they major in distorting love. They grind grace into something that is grotesque. They muddy mercy and they pimp peace to be unrecognizable by the Jesus who is its flawless architect and archetype. They write theological checks that the Bible will not cash. They've got, you could say, a big mouth, a big mouth, a big mouth, a mouth almighty, tongue everlasting that habitually jibber jabbers about nonsense. On the other hand, righteous instruction bespeaks a love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience and sincere faith, Paul writes. Paul beautifully communicates in verses 8 through 11 that God's law exists for our good. Say that with me. Good. Good. A little louder now. Good. Good. One more time for the Trinity. Good. Good. There you go. God's law exists for our good, and yet the strong caveat there is that it must be employed properly. And so it's with an epic 68-word sentence, a 68-word sentence spanning verses 9 through 11, as only a loyal child of faith can, that Paul contends that with its regulations and guidelines, the law is intended for one kind of person, the lawless. Whosoever in thought Whosoever in word, whosoever in deed runs contrary to the glorious gospel of God. Paul is referencing here a a key Christian precept, and it's found in Exodus 20, verses 1 through 17, and you can also find it in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 6 through 21. It's what we call the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments. 
So whether anecdotally or with intentionality, perhaps you have a modicum of conversant familiarity with what God has said here. If you don't, we're going to go over it. Number one, you shall have no other gods before me. Number two, you shall not make for yourself an idol. Three, you shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God. Number four, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Number five, honor your mother and your father. Number six, you shall not murder. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. Number eight, you shall not steal. You shall not give false witness against your neighbor. Number nine and number 10, you shall not covet anything, specifically anything that belongs to your neighbor. As is Paul's want, he, he does not mince words in providing examples, though not exhaustive of what dishonoring God looks like. If you peep his run-on sentence, it's, it's all in plain sight. No distinctions are made between conception or 24 weeks euthanasia or assisted suicide. No immunities are given for the consequences of choosing to drive drunk or to shoot up a Bible study in Charleston, South Carolina. We simply find the noun murderers. And verse 10 starts with another word, fornicators, denoting the voluntary sexual intercourse of unmarried persons or folks that are married, just not married to the other person with whom they're being intimate. Y'all following me? And then there's this other term, it's, it's sodomites, which means those who engage in copulation with a member of the opposite sex. And then you have slave traders, which of course is an all too familiar livelihood in our nation, both past and present, and there are liars, and then there are those who dare to lie under oath, which we call perjurers, and he continues to sum it all up, whatever else is contrary to the sound teaching that conforms to the glorious gospel. If we don't see ourselves anywhere in any of what 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 11 describes, then let me tell you that pride has blinded us, all of us. Our inability to meet the standard is precisely why Jesus came. So if, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. By no means are we defined by the law, but we need its truth to be our best selves individually and corporately as a Christian community. If no one's told you, I'm going to tell you today, God is not dead and neither is his law. Jesus intervened in human history not to abolish, but to fully fulfill his law. He, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician. But those who are sick, I, I've come to call not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Can you imagine with me maybe what life in our already broken society would be minus traffic laws? It would be unbearable with chaos rising on every corner and incomprehensible gridlock gripping every mile of roadway. Anarchy would wait with bated breath in every corner ready to pounce. A human purge by way of motor vehicles is what we would face. And yet even with all of the many traffic laws that we do have and their accompanying penalties that can result in both monetary deduction and incarceration, drivers are still forever misbehaving. 
exhibiting reckless disregard for self, reckless disregard for neighbor, and reckless disregard for God. Spiritually, this cesspool of hurt is what life is like outside of Christ. And it's why, though the law is good, Jesus makes the difference. So, I know that the school year is new and electrifying and it's booming with, with such possibility and, and it's actually precisely because of that that I need to ask you, how is your soul doing? How is your soul doing navigating the traffic patterns of this thing called life? For you, is it just another rolling stop one after another? Are you spiritually speeding? Or maybe it's aggressive or distracted driving. Have you committed a spiritual DUI or DWI, trying to be the master of your own fate, and you've realized that, you know, this not working out so well? Meanwhile, the good Lord is saying to you, don't turn on red. He's saying, do not enter. He's he's saying, use caution, pass with care, lane ends, merge left, and it's all for your welfare, not for your harm. It's to give you a future with hope. Disregarding God's double yellow solid lines will not end well. And so it's in Jesus that the gospel secures forgiveness without prejudice, but only when, with humility, we confess our wickedness and we turn from it to God. If you want accident forgiveness, you only need to find it in the good hands of the shepherd. His name is Jesus. If you want accident forgiveness, you can only find it in the hands of God. Go in peace.